Let us rise. <coughs> Grace, mercy, and especially God's peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends of Christ, the basis for our meditation today is taken from the epistle text, Paul's second letter to Timothy. And Paul was trying to impart to Timothy the wisdom, the strength, and the courage to continue on. And even in the face of adversity, to remain true. And so he begins in chapter 3, it says, As for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it. And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will, endure, will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure sufferings, and do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Here ends the text. You may be seated. Probably one of the stranger titles I've ever had for a sermon, Poison Ivy. Poison ivy is one of those things you run across that you don't want to run across. You don't plan on it. Nobody ever says, I'm going to go out in the woods and find a patch of poison ivy and just roll in it. That's good. But when you get poison ivy, most often they tell you, they, they give you a cure, they say, well, put this lotion on it, and then, then they tell you something that I've lived with all my life. You see, I was born with psoriasis. I've had psoriasis my whole life. I've tried everything under the sun except injecting the drugs that lower your immune system. I tried that once with pills, and oh my goodness, that was terrible. I'll never do that again. Found out I'm allergic to something. But all my life, everybody's been telling me, with the best of intentions, the simple thing, and I tried it, I said, well, how can I relate this to the common person, to the person who, not common, but the person who doesn't have psoriasis? And I thought, poison ivy. Because when you get poison ivy, they tell you what? Just don't scratch. It's like, wow, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> you know, you get poison ivy, you will scratch yourself raw. You will scratch yourself till you bleed. And, and you still won't scratch enough. You may have those times when your back itches and you rub up against the door frame. You just scratch because you've got to scratch it, an itch that needs to be scratched. And so Paul here is talking about we're going to go through this verse a little backwards, this passage a little backwards. At the end, he says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth, and wander off into myths. You see, when you, when you have an itch, you'll do almost anything to scratch it, and... and You'll try anything to get rid of it. I give my parents credit. They tried everything, but some of the things made me feel really weird. You know, I mean, just, just some, of the, some of those hokum cures for psoriasis which make you feel more freakish than real. And when you have psoriasis, when you have poison ivy, you'll put on stuff that you would never put on, that calamine lotion or whatever. You'll make yourself look all splotchy and try to, try to cover it up. And you find out the cows, well, the cow line, that none of the cows work very well, even in California. <laughs> that scratching distracts you. When it comes into your mind that you have to itch, there's nothing else really that you think about. It, it comes over your mind and you and you're just, you know, and even if they tell you don't scratch, you sit there and you just grit your teeth and all you think about is, I can't scratch, I can't scratch. Nothing else. You can't distract yourself. Satan uses our itching ears 
And what that means is, is stuff we want to hear, we want it to be a certain way. Boy, you know, God, shouldn't it be this way? Well, I think this is what God's Word said. We, we distract ourselves until we no longer are seeking the truth. We find someone who tells us something that eases our conscience and scratches our ears. That when we hear our sinfulness, well, it's not really sinfulness because God is, God is, is looking over here. He's not concerned about your little white lies. He's not concerned about this area of sinfulness. I love the joke about at the fellowship dinner, the, the, uh, they put a sign and said, do not, do not touch the cake and put underneath, God is watching. Somebody underneath wrote, grab the cookies, God's watching the cake. <laughs> Satan tries to distract us. He tries to get us to listen to the wrong stuff. He tries to fill our, our, our minds with, with <coughs> things which are not godly, which don't follow God's rules. You see, he's trying to get us to scratch our itching ears. And the question becomes, where is our focus when that happens? It's not on God, it's on us. Luther said, man is curved inward. We're, we're all navel gazers. We're concerned primarily about ourselves. Even our, 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 altruistic, our altruistic motives of, of helping others can be turned against us if we start to feel pride in it. We're having a food drive, a canned food drive for the, for the food bank, and as we bring food in, we'll feel good about that, and that's fine. We should, we should be glad that we're helping others. But if we start to say, well, you know how many cans I turned in? You're showing that your focus is on the wrong place. It's in pride and in self rather than in helping others. So when we get this itch of our ears, when we have psoriasis, when we have poison ivy, and I didn't use the one that I've never had, thank goodness, but always makes me itch every, every school year when I hear about it. When you hear about lice, everybody starts to go like this. <laughs> God, don't, don't tell me, I'm trying. Just don't do it to me. But how do we ease the itch? Paul tells us in this text very simply. He says, he says to Timothy, he says, As for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believe, knowing from whom you have learned it. If you have a trusted teacher, trust that teacher. Don't think, you know, when your kids are growing up, suddenly, uh, Mark Twain once said, I was amazed how stupid my parents were when I went away to college and how much they learned in the four years I was gone. <laughs> All of us have thought at times our parents were just clueless about the way things were in the world today. And if we live long enough, we should just go and apologize to them. <laughs> just say sorry. Sorry, I was wrong. But he says... Continue in this. He says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching. He says, use the whole Bible. Don't be afraid of part. Don't be afraid of part of it. There are times we, we go, well, I don't want to talk about that because that sounds really strange. We don't talk about Jacob wrestling with God. And, and think about how when God touched Jacob's hip and put it out of place, for the rest of his life, Jacob probably lived because of that. He had a bad hip. And many of us know how that feels. And, but guess what? Every time he lived, he remembered God. Somebody might have said, boy, that's really bad for God to harm you in that way. And Jacob would have said, oh my goodness. It's a blessing because every day I remember. I remember how God, God wrestled with me. And how he wouldn't give up on me and I wouldn't give up on him. So he says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction. You know, it doesn't matter what the culture says. It matters what God's Word says. And there are times when, when God's Word flies in the face of what popular culture is telling you. All you need to do is look at the paper and everything you see that is being promoted as normal is probably abnormal in the Scriptures. All right, let's not use the word abnormal. Let's use it sinful. Because it's a sin. And so the Scriptures are to be used for teaching, to educate. When somebody falls, for reproof and for correction and for training in righteousness. See, we're not perfectly righteous, we're tra in training. 
Every one of us is at a, a place on our journey. Whenever we see some, I, I tell you, I, I watch some people running around San Lorenzo trying to get healthy. And some of them need a lot more running than others. But I never, I never say anything about them because, my goodness, they're trying. They've taken the first step. They are training, they are training their bodies, and then that training begins with the first, with the first step in running. Our training in righteousness, you know, later on they may run a 5K, they may run a 2K, they may run a marathon. But it all started in the beginning of their training. And that's how our lives go in our faith life. Our training, we, we take steps, baby steps at times. And then we become more, more in tune with God's desire for us. And so the question is, what, how do we ease the itch? It's we replace what Satan is trying to pour into us with what God wants us to know. If we fill our lives with God's word, if we fill our lives with prayer, with, with, uh, with focusing on God's desires for our life, suddenly there's no room for Satan's lies. Oh, the world may have them, but, but we filled ourselves with the good stuff. This reminded me of, of when you would have Thanksgiving dinner, and we were told not to, not to snack, because why? We would fill ourselves up before the meal. So don't be tempted by the snacks, if you will, of the world. Don't fill yourself up on the garbage. Seek the good food, God's word. You might say, but what should I study? And the thing is, the whole Bible. Little portions of it are, are great. It's good to study a portion, but not try to put it in the context of the whole. Because God gave us all the Word of God. And what is the benefit of it? Paul tells us we learn patience. And we are urged to continue in what we have learned. Saw a poster that played fun of the uh, everything I know I need to know I learned in kindergarten. The answer was everything I they said instead, everything I need to know I learned in Sunday school. Last century, there was a theologian called Karl Barth. He was, he was very famous. He was probably the best known theologian of the 20th century. And he was once asked, he was asked, he's also a songwriter, hymn writer, and he was asked, what's the greatest Christian song? And the person waited, and, and they thought it'd be something like, oh, you know, he's Luther in the Mighty Fortress, comes right up there on number one. Handel's Messiah, any of this. And Karl Barr said, he said, the greatest Christian song is Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible has my son. Little ones to him belong. We are weak, but he is strong. You see, it's just that simple. Paul says, continue in what you have learned. Don't get distracted by the world. Don't, don't follow down false trails. God's word is simple, it is pure, and it is all correct. It's 100% from, from beginning to end. It's God's word, and it's useful for us. And there's no portion that isn't useful for us at some point in our life. There are times we will read something again, and we'll go, I never saw that before. <laughs> I've read, that, I've read that song, I've read that passage before, and something new comes to me. That's why we keep returning to the scriptures. Because God waits for the proper moment to open our minds, open our eyes, and some stuff we've tried to learn too early. I learned when we had Kelly Jr. that four-year-olds can't learn to tell time. Because Pam told me, what are you trying to do teaching them to tell time? That's why I learned four-year-olds can't tell time, because he wasn't doing a good job, and I was getting frustrated. But he tells time pretty well today. <laughs> that's good. Don't ask our daughter about left and right. That's a whole lost cause. But it's all good. So as we go forth this day, let us remember that we have been redeemed by God. We are his chosen people. He invites us to come to him. He will fill us with all good things. Let us not get distracted along the way. Let us not eat before our meal is ready. Let us not fill up on junk, the junk of this world. But let us fill ourselves with the word of God. For then we shall have everything we need. May God be with you this day and each day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us rise.